This morning, I'm going to be in a few different places. It's going to be hard for you to turn to everything I go to, so what I would recommend is you go to Acts chapter 1, verse 14, and when you get there, if you're a note taker, you can just write in the margins where I go, or in your book, or whatever. If you try to follow with me, you're going to have a hard time, because we're going to about four different places. Because I'm going to be in Acts, I'm going to be in Matthew, I'm going to be in Mark, and I'm going to be in Ephesians. To make a point. Now, I will say I have preached out of all of these texts at different times, and I just decided to put them all together. We're, it's kind of unique. We're looking at forgiveness. And we're looking at forgiveness from all these different viewpoints. We're getting the words of Jesus, the words of Paul, the words of uh, Peter, because P- the Gospel of Mark was written by Peter. Mark was just his secretary. And we're also getting um, from, uh, let's see, Luke, from the book of Acts. You say, well, but it's all the Word of God. Yes, the Holy Spirit of God has inspired your Bible. And the Holy Spirit of God inspired and used men and used their flaws, used their education, used their lack of education. So you find different ways of putting the same thing from different people because God is using different people to accomplish His goal. Never leave out the author that's being used by God as well. Some of us preachers were pretty bad. I've done it in the past. As if the Bible just fell out of the sky. Like like the Book of Mormon or something. An angel came and said, write all this down. God inspired through the Holy Spirit people to put these things down and to pass them on. So you're going to get human errors sometimes. You're going to get the human side of it. You're going to get people's personalities. But they all point to one major thing, that's Jesus. And they all point to several other things, and one of those things is forgiveness. And I want to hit on forgiveness, because I think it is something that we all need to grasp, and you may have gotten a hold of it already, and you say, well, there's nobody I don't forgive. Now, if you run into somebody that needs to forgive somebody, you need to remember these words. You need to remember these texts. You need to write these things down, pass it on. Because unforgiveness is something that is killing our church folks. I think it is one of the worst things in every church. Most issues coming up in a church is because somebody didn't forgive somebody. Let's look at Acts chapter 1, verse 14. It says, All these were continually united in prayer along with the women. Now, when it says along with the women, this is more than likely talking about the apostles' wives as well. We don't think about that, do we? I mean, we know about Peter having a wife, but multiple guys had wives. So we're talking about the apostles' wives as well. They were all continuing in prayer along with the women. So the men and the women were praying together. If you know anything about Judaism and you go into the temple or the synagogue, the men and the women didn't pray together. Things have changed, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Now, we know Jesus had six half-brothers, according to Mark 6, 3. So this is, this is a crowd of people having a prayer meeting, gathered together, continuing in prayer with one another. They were, my point in bringing out Acts 1, 14, you say, I look at that, I don't see anything about forgiveness. You're right. You see unity. You see a church that is in one accord, the King James says. Which is where that, that joke comes from, where if you, they, um, they, all were in, they all died in one accord in a car wreck, Honda Accord. It's a terrible joke. Old men tell it often. Then I found myself in accord with five preachers, and I thought, good grief. We are doing the joke right here. But they were all in one accord. They were all working together. We see in Acts chapter 2 verse 1 where they were praying together in one place. So like when we get together on Wednesday nights and have our prayer thing, we didn't come up with that. That's biblical. I went through this in Acts a while back. Acts chapter 4, 32. They were of one heart and one soul. So they were united together. And think about this church. This church has got some messed up folks in it. It does. 
This is not the perfect church, but they were united. Peter. Peter all the time messing up. Until you get in the book of Acts later on when he got his act together. But up to this point, Peter has denied the Lord three times. Publicly, I'll go with you. I'll die with you. Little girl comes up. Aren't you with him? No, no, I don't. Cussing and stuff in front of a little girl. I don't know this man, all that stuff. I mean, that's a pretty big deal. After you spent three years with him. And he's going to be the leader. That's how it works sometimes. I'd say the most messed up person in here is me. And I'm standing before you. Sorry about that. God did it. I don't know. It's hard to be back there in the sound booth, one of y'all up here. But God did it this way. Thomas. Thomas doubted the resurrection, even though Jesus taught it to him over and over and over, and he still doubted that. Uh, we got the women. The women, they're very brave. They, they were with Jesus when the men ran away at the crucifixion, but, and they were brave to go to the tomb. But the problem was they went to the tomb doing the work of an undertaker. They didn't go to the tomb to see a risen Savior, even though he told them what he would do. Everybody has been failing God, failing Jesus along the way. His brothers and his own mama came to pull him away from doing the ministry at one point. But now they're all together and they are praying because love enabled them to forgive and to shake the world according to Acts 17, 6, they shook the world up. Because they were all together, they were united. There's three biblical calls for forgiveness I want to look at. The first one I want to look at is Matthew 18. If you know anything about biblical forgiveness, you know you're going to go straight to the words of Jesus. Matthew 18, 15 through 17. First part. We kind of got like a three-step phase that Jesus gave us. Now, I'm going to tell you about a part that might bother you a little bit. But don't let it bother you. Trust me. <coughs> the beginning of verse 15 says, If your brother sins against you, go and rebuke him in private. Okay. Here's the deal. Again, the Bible didn't fall out of the sky. Okay? Human beings have had a role in the Bible. That's why we work hard. And I work to see what the original language had to say. And looking at the original language, you look at the earlier manuscripts, what you find is that phrase isn't in there. As in most versions of the Bible, nothing wrong with that, but in earlier manuscripts, you don't find it. So you got to decide, what does this verse mean? So you go into the context surrounding the verse. And what just got through happening was that the Lord himself told a parable about the lost sheep. One of the sheep of a fold walking off and him going after them. In that context, he starts this thing. So I don't have a problem with it saying, if your brother sins against you. Because what he's saying is, if he sins against the congregation. Here's the deal. You sin against somebody in here, you sin against all of us in here. You hold a grudge and unforgiveness against somebody, you're hurting the fellowship of the church. So, it's not just, well, so and so, the preacher didn't shake my hand, so I'm mad at him, so I, he hurt my feelings. No, it's so much more, the sin... Especially the sin of unforgiveness is going to be a problem here. We have to get to the point where we forgive. So if your brother sins against you, go and rebuke him in private. That's step one, verse 15. So somebody's done something wrong. Say somebody in here has sinned or they sinned against you. They sinned against the whole congregation when they did. You don't go, get on the phone, start running your mouth. Talking about that person, run them into the ground. No, that's not what we do. You go to that person, but you go by yourself first. And the, the whole thing, if you go in by yourself with them, you're avoiding bringing shame on that person. That's why Jesus is telling us here to do it this way. You don't go get a crowd, an angry mob up, and drag them after this guy or girl or whoever and say, look what he did to me, or look what he's done. Because that's shameful to him. Because the whole goal in doing this 
If he listens to you, you have won your brother. See it in the text. So the whole goal in doing it this way is restoring that person. Restoring that person in a relationship with you. Restoring that person in a right relationship with the church. Restoring that individual. It's always the goal if someone has sinned against God and sinned against the church or sinned against you as an individual, the goal is always to restore them. We want them to be right with God. We do not want to break them down. We do not want to shame them. We do not want to ruin them. We do not want them to get what they deserve. That's not how you handle forgiveness. So you go and you talk. And you know what? For some of us, that's the hardest thing in the world to do. And I get it. Oh, I'm, I can be a little confrontational. Sorry. I try, I try to be gentle. It doesn't bother me to go to somebody, but I know folks that hate to do it. But the best way for you to handle whatever that issue is, first step, handle it privately if you can. Nobody's got to know. Wouldn't you want, if you had sinned against God, sinned against her, wouldn't you want a brother or sister to pull you aside privately? And instead of running their mouth, slandering you, talking about you, and just gently telling you that, hey, Give them a, a rebuke, according to Proverbs, to let them know that they got, look, this thing is not right. Well, because you're praying for reconciliation. You're lovingly telling your brother that you've got something, your brother or sister, something that is dividing you. And if he responds, if this, if this, if this individual responds correctly to you going to them, then you have restored this person. And you have gained them. You have won your brother. We hope it doesn't have to go any further than step one. But just in case, as it often does, then here's what you do in step two, verse 16. But if he won't listen, wasn't that your first question? Is that not what first jumped in your mind? Well, I've tried to talk to certain people. You can't talk to certain people. And some people just fools according to the Bible. And I try to go to them, and they won't listen. All right, well, if they won't listen, then you take one or two more with you. You've got to have witnesses. So that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. So when you've got other people involved, now when you pick certain people, be careful who you pick. Make sure they're people of wisdom. Make sure they're people that you spiritually trust. Hopefully you can come to me, one of the deacons, somebody. Don't get sister so-and-so that's joining with you in anger towards this person for the wrong that they have done. Do not gang up on this individual. Well, they did me wrong. You've got to forgive. See, you first got to come to the point where you're able to forgive that individual so that you can start trying to restore that individual. So the first time you tried, you tried to talk to them, and it didn't work. So the testimony of two or three, you get wisdom from the people there because other people might see your issue and be able to speak to it and help you resolve it in a way you couldn't. So I might pick a brother or sister to come with me to talk to this individual and they be able to say something, be a peacekeeper, where I'm lacking the ability to be the peacekeeper because I just want to go slap them upside the head. So it's good to get somebody who can help you with that. All right? And you've got to make sure the witnesses want to restore the brother or sister as well. Verse 17, this is the third step. If he pays no attention, now when it says he, you got to know in this whole pronoun stupid thing going around, listen, when it says he, it means human beings, men, women, children, everybody. Well, you should know how to use a pronoun. It's offensive. It's just, it's just the word he. If he pays no attention, you know, you're abusing the pronoun. You know how you abuse pronouns? By not using them the way they were intended to be used. Sorry. That wasn't from God. That was from me. 
If he pays no attention to them, so you've gone privately, that didn't work. You've gone with some witnesses, that didn't work. Then you tell church. That doesn't mean you get up and say, Brother Wayne, why are you preach? I need to say something. Sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so, that's not how you tell the church, all right? Don't wait to prayer request time on Wednesday night. I got to tell the That's not what we're talking about here. You need to let the pastor know. You need to let the leadership of the church know what is going on. So if they won't, and you say, I've gone to them privately. I've done everything Jesus told me to do. I've gone to them privately. I've tried to get witnesses and to go. They won't see me. They won't talk to me. They won't listen. They won't pay attention to them, me, anybody. I'm telling you what's going on. And if he doesn't pay attention even to the church. Now remember, this is in the area of sin. If this person will not repent of this sin, let him be like an unbeliever and a tax collector to you. I thought the Jews were Republicans. I didn't know. Let them be like an unbeliever and a tax collector to you. What does that mean, that last part? A tax collector and an unbeliever was considered by the Jews to be an outsider. That means, folks, we have to church people sometimes. And we should not be afraid to do it. I'll tell you a story. A pastor friend of mine had a couple in the church, killing the church. He stood up to them. He went to the deacons. He went to everybody, got them all together. These people were wrong, dead wrong. They, did, they tried to restore them, tried to restore them with witnesses, tried to do everything they could. These people were out to kill this church. And so they did church discipline. I went to the preacher's meeting. This was not in Tuscaloosa. I went to the preacher's meeting. Five or six pastors sitting around the table, and they all began dogging out the pastor. You can't kick members out of a church. Biblically, yeah. Yeah. When you get squirrely, lose your mind, won't repent of it, you're not going to sing in the church, you're not going to serve in the nursery, you're not going to do, you're not going to do anything, and if you don't repent, it might come to the point you're not welcome in the fellowship. Because the biggest thing we have to do is get sin out of the church. It was like, well, we all sin. We're all a bunch of sinners. I guess nobody can come into the church. No, there's a difference between those sins that you commit and you fall and you repent and you get back up and you're doing and those sins that people do open in the face of God, spitting in the face of God, refusing to repent, refusing to acknowledge God in it. If there had been church discipline a long time, going through a lot of these churches and ages, we wouldn't have homosexual pastors. We wouldn't have homosexual deacons. We wouldn't have all this stuff going on in the church. We wouldn't have liberalism in the church. We wouldn't have people preaching and teaching that this is not the Word of God. We wouldn't have people teaching heresy in the church because somebody would have stood up to that joker when he started it and put an end to it. Well, but we might lose some people. I'd rather lose as many as I gotta lose to keep the church right. That's the goal. My job here, believe it or not, there's nowhere in the Bible where it's my job to grow this church. Because some pastors think that's their job. It's not my job. My example is Jesus. Every time he got a crowd, he ran them off. Crowd shows up, he's got, all right, y'all gotta drink my blood. Gotta eat my flesh. They're like, I don't know about all this. I was wondering how he turned water into wine. Now we got to drink his blood. So what we got to do is keep the fellowship united, make sure we are biblical, make sure we are faithful to the Word of God, and make sure that any sin crops up, unrepentant sin, that person may have to be removed from the fellowship. Is it anything any of us want to do? No. But Jesus just gave you three steps on how to restore people. With the hopes the whole time in restoring your brother to Christ. But if they keep on, you, treat, you, you have to, that last part really means you're just going to, as a church, have to assume they lost. They're lost. But here's the, the beautiful thing is, though, they can always come back. They can always repent and come back. We went from church and people from dancing and wearing pants to not churching anybody. It's crazy. It's like we went from one extreme to the other. We gotta get somewhere in the middle. 
I love reading old church records where people got kicked out. Oh, brother so and so was, you know, sold a mule to somebody and cheated them out, so the church disciplined them. And two years later, he came back and repented and came back into fellowship. Yeah, that's the goal. That's the goal. We can't let mess happen and go on. All right. If you you say, well, as an individual. You're talking about the church and them sinning against church. As an individual, if I try to go to them, I try to get somebody else to go, and they refuse to listen to me, then what do I do? Let me tell you, you've done everything you can do. You can go on with your life and be happy. It's on them. God is not going to... If you have truly forgiven that person and you tried to talk to them, tried to restore the brother or sister, then guess what? God requires nothing else of you. You're good. And I know... That you, you feel like, well, but it's not fixed. I want it fixed. Some things you just can't fix. It's on them at that point. It's between them and God. And again, I always try to say, if somebody, you feel like they've wronged you, they don't know they've wronged you, don't, don't just go up to somebody, I want, I want you to know I forgive you for being a jerk. And they're like, what did I do? You know, that's not going to help it either. Well, somebody may have hurt, hurt you, done something to you, Right now, just, just forgive them. Because I'm telling you, you're carrying a weight of burden that you are not meant to carry. And I know I had to get to the point where I forgave my father. And I had to struggle with how do I forgive my father, yet honor my father. That's fun. So anybody that's been abused in here, you know how it is, hard it is to, 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 to forgive your abuser. But if you keep carrying it, you will always be the victim. And that's one of the big problems in this country right now. Everybody's a victim. Guess what? Everybody's a victim. But some people don't live like it, act like it, and walk like it. And expect special privileges because you've been abused. Everybody's been abused somehow by somebody. Nobody gets out of this world without being victimized about something. We need to forgive. That's the only way you're going to get, for, for, get freedom from this problem. Now, let's look at Mark 11.25. Forgiving, we forgive so that our prayers won't be hindered. I'm going to tell you something. If you've been harboring unforgiveness towards somebody, especially a brother or sister in the fellowship, more than likely God has not been listening to any of your prayers. Since then, unforgiveness, God, there, there is a roadblock. There is something about it. it. I've seen it over and over. It's obvious that every Christian who tries to pray with unforgiveness in their hearts, that Christian will find a wall that they will run. You will hit a wall in your prayers. And those, I, just, I feel like my prayers aren't even going anywhere. Not going to if there's unforgiveness. And whenever you stand praying, the reason is, well, that means every time we pray, we got to stand up and pray. That's not what that means. What that means is in the Jewish culture at that time, people stood up and prayed publicly. He's talking about that. This is not a, a doctrine for us to every time we pray, we got to get up and pray. Okay? If you want to get up and pray, get up and pray. That's fine. If you want to bow down, bow down. Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone does that leave anybody out no sir it don't matter who it is against anyone forgive him so that your father in heaven will also forgive you your wrongdoing man. so we got to understand that man we have been forgiven so much how and the bible talks about this how is it that we cannot forgive people who have wronged us considering how much God has forgiven us for sinning against Him to the point where the Son of God came to the earth, lived as a human, sinless, laid down His life on an old rugged cross, became sin, became my sin, became your sin. We put the nails in His hands and feet. We put the spear in His side. We crucified Him. But yet, you tell me, you can't forgive somebody. Really? Now, 
your prayers are not going to be effective unless you forgive. And then, not only is there a lack of hindrance of prayer, but Ephesians 4, 30, 32, that I preached not too long ago, don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. So, not only have you grieved other individuals and you've hurt the church, now you're grieving God, who sealed you for the day of redemption. Verse 31. All bitterness, anger, and wrath, insult, slander must be removed from you with all wickedness. That means that person wronged you. You don't get to go talk about them. You don't get to gossip. You don't get to slander. You don't get to insult. You don't get to do any of that. you got to remove all of that. In verse 32, And be kind and compassionate to one another. What's that next part? Forgiving one another. It just keeps showing up. Forgiving one another. Why? Well, just as God also forgave you in Christ. So, why did the early church have so much power? Even though they were some flawed folks in that church. The members were weak and they were imperfect people. But the Holy Spirit was their source of power. Not just an indwelling of the Holy Spirit when you get saved, but a filling of the Holy Spirit when you surrender yourself completely to the Holy Spirit of God. Letting Him have you, every part of you, giving yourself over to God, filling you with the Holy Spirit. Because you can't do that if you don't forgive. There's no way. So we can forgive. Why? Verse 32. Because we have been forgiven. So I want you to know, this morning, is there anything that you're holding on to, you need to let it go. Father, we pray, Lord, that you search our hearts. If there's anywhere, anything that we have done where we have not forgiven somebody, where we have not shown true repentance and asked you to forgive that individual no matter what they've done to us and, and, and set us free from the harbor of, uh, harboring of anger towards them and unforgiveness. God, if there's anybody in this church that needs to let go, I pray that they let go and they seek to restore that individual. And if not, then fine, but they be made right with you. God, we ask for your help in this. Because there is nothing in our flesh that wants to do this. There is nothing in the world that makes us want to do this. The only thing that can make us want to do this, God, is the power of your Holy Spirit. So we pray for your help in this. Would you stand with us?